David R. here. Today I'm going to discuss this book, This Perfect Day by Ira Levin. That's the author right there. The book is set in a dystopian world where an AI computer called Uni or Unicomp controls the world. It thinks for people, it gives them permission to do things or not do things. It is like their God. People even say, thank uni. They don't say, thank God. There are treatments that people are given. And in these treatments, I don't know what's, what the treatments contain, but people are non-threatening and docile when they receive them. The men are sterile and their testosterone is lower. They can't even grow facial hair. The women are infertile while they are on these treatments. But if they get off of the treatments, things start to change. Holidays are named after the four most important people, like the founding fathers, let's say. Christ, Marx, Wood, and we. I'm surprised Christ is on this list because... In this world, people are not religious. <laughs> there is no spirituality at all. People don't believe in anything. So the holidays were were Christmas, Marxmas, Unification Day, Woods and Wee's birthday. Christmas, interesting, right? The main character is Chip. He's slightly different. He was born with one green eye and, and one brown eye. Everybody else has brown eyes, but he just happened to have one green eye, which is interesting. His neighbor, which is name and number combined, is really L-I-R-M, but people call him Lee, 35M4419. That's his neighbor. His grandfather, Papa Jan, gave him a nickname. He called him Chip as in chip off the old block. And everybody has this neighbor. Even, even countries like Europe, it is E-U-R-55131. Or Mexico is M-E-X-10405. I have notes here. So. <laughs> when Chip was 10 years old, his Papa Jan took him to see uni, the real uni. It's, it's down, down underground. But most people see what uni wants them to see. That uni is this brightly colored, wonderful, happy machine. But really it's not. So Papa Jan, before he takes Chip down to see this, he avoids the scanners. He doesn't um, scan his bracelet. Everybody wears a bracelet so that they can be tracked at all times. They have to scan into doors. Uh, wherever they go, this bracelet is there to track them and, you know, keep an eye on them, keep an eye on their cattle, I suppose, or their slaves. So Uni was really just a twin roll of different colored metal blocks and Chip asked him, he's like, why is it so cold down here? Papa Jan said, because it's dead. It's lifeless. That's what he said dramatically. So everybody has what are called advisors. They are, I guess you could say like counselors. These people adjust their medications. They, they you know, act as officers, you could even say, because if... If somebody comes to them and rats out somebody else, they can have that person arrested or given more treatments. So Papa Jan had said some disparaging things about uni. And so Chip, being at this age, it, you know, he didn't really, I don't think he knew right from wrong that well, at least. He told his advisor about it. So Papa Jan had to suffer the consequences for that. Years later, when Chip was at the academy, he met a guy named Carl W.L. Carl was an artist. He was a free thinker. 
He actually felt things. And his artwork was very detailed. But he didn't draw people with bracelets on. See, the bracelets are very important. He drew people without them. And so Chip had a talk with him at first, but Carl wouldn't obey. He still continued to draw these people without the bracelets. So Chip ratted him out. The second person he ratted out. He, he ratted him out. And so Carl was taken wherever and given treatments. But Chip felt guilty for this. So he kept a drawing that Carl made. It was of a horse. A finely detailed drawing. And he kept it with him for most of his life. So after um, ratting out Carl, Chip started to, to think about things internally. He couldn't talk to people about these things. He questioned the total cakes they ate. Total cakes were just these things that everybody had to eat. He questioned the coveralls everybody had to wear. So yeah, everybody had to wear coveralls. They wore the same clothes, they ate the same foods, you know. The sameness of the members' rooms, another thing. Everybody had the same rooms and the same contents in those rooms. One night in mid march Chip came to his room and found a note lodged in his mouthpiece. I don't know. I guess the mouthpiece is worn at night when they go to bed. And it said, you seem like a fairly unusual member. Would you like to meet some unusual members? And so... Four days later, he got another note, and this one was signed by a person named Snowflake. And so Chip meets these people. One of them, their leader, is named King. There's obviously Snowflake, who brought him there. There was Lilac and some others. Now, Snowflake wanted him for herself, even though Chip was strongly attracted to another girl, King's girl, Lilac. They told him how to get his treatments reduced. Like He would pretend that he was really tired or forgetful and things like that. So the advisor that he had um, got Chip's treatment reduced as a result of this so that Chip could think more clearly. Not everybody did this, but there were a few. <laughs> and um, now the meetings took place at a pre U museum. Pre U meant pre uni. This was when people actually made decisions for themselves. They didn't rely on the AI computer. And in this place, Chip went through old books. He learned French on his own. He studied maps, and in those maps, he discovered that there might have been cities or islands of incurable people. These were people who weren't vaccinated with the uh, treatments. They made decisions on their own. They, they led freer lives. He believed that these places existed. So one time out of the blue, Chip's advisor came to him. He was in he was in Chip's room actually. And so Chip got in late from, you know, studying French or whatever he was doing. And his advisor said, "You tricked me. You tricked me into lowering your treatments and all these things." And so he took Chip with him to a treatment center. But along the way, Chip shoved his advisor down the escalator. He tried fighting his way to freedom, but he was outnumbered. There were just too many, and so he was captured. And when he got his treatments, he, I guess he was given some sort of truth serum or something, but he ratted out all of his friends. And so King, the leader of that group, hung himself, and the others were captured and treated. Now, Chip was cured, as in giving regular treatments. He was cured for a while. But there was like a massive earthquake that hit the area, and a lot of people got killed. And so his treatments were delayed. I, I believe they were delayed by 10 days. 
And so he started to get his old memories back. He started to think for himself. He started to become rebellious again. And so he was outside one day and he happened to notice uh, a flat leaf lying on a wet stone. And then he, you know, he had his wrapper to his total cakes in his hand and he was just twisting it around. It gave him an idea though. He thought, hmm, I can avoid treatments altogether. So what he did was he took this foil, wrapped it, and uh, put a bandage over it, and he avoided treatments. Six and a half years had passed, and he still thought of lilac. He was still heavily attracted to lilac. Uh, The last time he saw her, he had asked her to reveal her boobs to him, and she did it. (laughs) So he was thinking of her, all right? And now that he had not been given treatments for a while, he had to regularly shave, like all the time, you know, so that nobody would notice. He decided that he wanted to go where she lived. He knew she lived in AFR, which stood for Africa. His parents were on the same continent, and so he decided to go visit his parents, so to speak. (laughs) And he did. He did get permission eventually, and he visited his parents briefly, not very long. And his mother even asked him, are you ill again, Chip? And he's like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not sick. You know, being ill would be like you have freedom. You know, you have free thoughts. You think for yourself, that kind of thing. You know, what America used to be. And so he's like, no, no, I'm not sick. But he had to see lilac. So what he did was he called her first and found out that she was cured. And she wasn't married. But everybody had a signed boyfriends and girlfriends that they had to have sex with regularly. So she had a boyfriend, obviously. And so he decided to steal some overalls and a wrench and pretended to be a maintenance worker. And he got on a plane. And then when he got on a plane, he went into the bathroom, changed his clothes into his regular clothes. And then he flew to where she was. And he also um, stole some things from a museum. He stole a compass and some other things, like a gun as well. (laughs) And so he got to Lilac's room, and he held a gun on her and told her to come with him or or he would kill her. He, He kidnapped her. And he said if she made a scene, he would kill anybody who got in his way. So she came with him. And then he had a bicycle, and she had a bicycle, so they rode bicycles. And he... Kept her gagged and bound at night so that she couldn't escape. And she asked him why he kidnapped her. And he was like, because I love you. That's why. And she said, you're just sick. You're ill. But the further she got away from her treatments, her mind started to change and memories came back. And she believed that he had killed King. That's what she heard. But... And he's like, no, no, he hung himself. So they got into a fight one night or one day. And she bit him, bit his hand. And he uh, was so excited by this and its closeness to her that he actually raped her. And after the rape, she said, oh, it was only natural that you did that under the circumstances. (laughs) Wow. And so... She said, you don't need to tie me up anymore. I'm fine now because, you know, she hadn't had a treatment for a while. And so she she was better mentally and she started to fall for him. So I guess he really didn't have to rape her because he could have had sex with her soon after anyway. Once they found a beach, they um, hid in a cave and they had to hide from people. One little kid almost ratted them out, but... uh, she said something to the kid, and you know, and they went away. But um, they saw a boat, Chip and Lilac saw a boat, and uh, Chip decided to check it out. It looked like it was abandoned. So he, he checks it out, and it's fine. They get on it, and um, they head for an island, their island destination. But along the way, they are uh, they're robbed of their boat. A guy robs them of it and 
you know, takes their boat. So they're swimming and kind of drowning and all this, but they get rescued. And their rescuer tells them that where they're going is not paradise. But he, he knew people like them anyway. And so he said, you're not going to paradise, but at least it's more freedom than what they had before. He said, most people are ignorant, they're inbred and self-satisfied. Immigrants like Lilac and Chip are called steelies and native islanders were called lunkies. <laughs> well, eventually Chip and Lilac are married. They have a child too. And during this time though, Chip is nervous. He wants to destroy uni. He wants to blow it up. And so he gathers some people, he gathers money, bombs, weapons, and him and a team, they board a uh, freighter, you know, and uh, they, they head on over to the other side, and uh, they take bikes, they ride them to the airport, they get on a plane, they do exactly what Chip did before, pretend to be maintenance workers, and so they board the plane, but then after they get off the plane, Chip blows up parts of the airport. And so, so that's a distraction. And then they head out and um, they rode bicycles. Now, a couple people in this group, a man and a woman, decide they don't want to be part of it. They want to go their own way. They want to do their own thing. And the man who escaped or who left Chip, he blew himself up and the woman got captured. So Chip and two other men found the tunnel to Uni. And they once they got to the tunnel's rim, one of the guys, he held a gun on them. He was a traitor. And he led them through some corridors. And once they got to their destination where this guy led them to, they were greeted by members. They were cheered. And... Um, <laughs> Given this uh, happy welcoming, they're like, why is this? But uh, the thing is, a lot of people have done this before them, and they become part of this underground uh, group. These are the people who really control uni. These are the people who control the world, essentially. And um, Dover was the traitor. Carl was with Chip. And so um, Chip met Wee, spelled W-E-I. He had to be like 200 years old or something. But he would, he would just take other people's bodies. That's how Wee remained alive so long. His head was transferred to whomever. And his current body was from a marathon runner. During a luncheon or a you know, lunch meeting, we told Chip that the ultimate decisions were made by the people who didn't get the vaccine, the people who were untreated. They made decisions for everybody because people had to be rounded up and treated because they would make bad decisions or they would be unprotected. They would be like those people on the island doing whatever they want. He said that uh, people were motivated by selfishness and fear. So instead of fighting, Chip became a member of this group. He even got his green eye fixed where his eyes were brown. He attended many speaking engagements that we gave. He was one of them until another group came in. They were, uh, you know, captured the same way, you know, with a traitor and, you know, this Trader happened to be Anna. She was their shepherd or shepherd of this group. And Chip found out that she had bombs and guns. Well, <laughs> he is walking with her down a corridor and then he punches her in the stomach and he smashes her head against a wall and he takes the bombs. So he's not done yet, you see. So he... Um, takes the bombs to the lower level where Uni is at, and he um, throws a bomb in there, but it doesn't go off yet. And we follows him. They get into this violent confrontation, you know, a major attack. We falls over a railing, and, 
And uh, Chip continues to throw the bombs, but they don't go off yet until one happens to explode. And then the rest of them explode. And uh, we is burnt up. He is killed. Uni is destroyed. It's completely destroyed. People are lost. They don't know what to do now. So they have to think for themselves. They don't have to get treatments anymore. They, um, they have to rebuild their society without uni or without that group. You know? So uh, Chip decides that he's going to go back to the island. So he gets a helicopter and he looks at how things are below. And um, he did that. <laughs> you know? And so uh, he moves on. He goes uh, forward onto the islands to be with Lilac and his child. So this book is a mixture of Brave New World 1984 and Animal Farm. If you've read all those books, you'll know what I'm talking about. It also there's also a message in the book about over dependence upon technology, and I and I'm taking a quote from the song Mr. Roboto by Dennis DeYoung, and in it. He says, the problem's plain to see. Too much technology. Machines to save our lives. Machines dehumanize. Well, anyway, that's all I got. Talk to you later. Bye.